So we're going to spur some trees today and uh, talk about that and go through some techniques, big and small trees hopefully. There's a forest that I have in mind, logging country. Um, hopefully we can find some dead trees to spur, not that it matters so much in a forest. Um, if not, we'll we'll work on some live ones. Perhaps we can find a small tree that's seen better days, and jump straight onto a big tree, a big old fir, six-inch bark. You're not gonna harm that tree by putting a few spur marks in. Um, so we'll just talk quickly about uh, spurs in general. There's um, lots of different brands but looking at the spurs more specifically this is a pole gaff which is great for hardwoods um, comfortable you know it doesn't have to go through thick bark and uh, yeah it kind of keeps your leg close to the street it doesn't it's arguably they don't hurt as much or put as much pressure on um, the point of contact between the pad and your leg I suppose because it's uh, there's less leverage from the spur acting on your leg that might be true it might be bullshit um, now here's another spur this is a tree gaff longer than this one this is kind of an old style tree gaff, even though it's new. It was sold to me only a couple of years ago. Now, these are the gaffs that we're going to be using though. I don't know if you can see the difference. They're equally as long. I'm not sure how long that is. It looks almost not quite two inches, I don't think. maybe two inches but notice the one on my uh, right hand is uh, is far thicker and abrupt has more of an abrupt end so this is much less useful being thick and abrupt doesn't help you at all it, um, you need a narrow profile spur that's going to penetrate better. Uh, it needs a lot less pressure so you don't have to stamp them in so much you can depending on the tree you can almost just walk up. Let's look at that one again. The short gaff is also at a different angle. It doesn't extend out as far so nice for going up assuming the bark isn't thick not so good for coming down because when you're spurring down you're sort of reaching down with your foot as opposed to stepping up it, it, it you watch in reverse and it's the same but in practice it's different it's much easier to gaff out on a short spur especially one that doesn't extend outwards like this long one does more so if you're on a tree that perhaps takes a few twists and turns um, has a few bulges in it sometimes you reach down with your foot past a bulge and you're trying to find something to spur into with a short gaff you might not be able to reach anything because the bulge pokes out this can be a cut or, or whatever a cavity or who, who knows behind the wood it could be an old pruning wood and a stub sticking out or it could just be the curvature of the tree these however because they poke out further and the longer and they're kind of they're at a different angle they're much easier to reach down and find something solid to poke into that makes a big difference so a lot of climbers shy away from these who are predominantly doing hardwoods but you know what if you persevered with them 
for probably a week, you'd never go back to this. A little word about the spurs themselves. Um, these are steins uh, made by Spider Manufacturing. I think they are pretty much the same as the Climrite spurs, although I've never held two together, but it's the same people basically. Aluminum or carbon fiber is the way to go. Steel is okay, it gets the job done, but lightweight spurs make a massive difference. Don't be fooled in thinking it won't make much difference because it really does. You know, when you're doing a lot of spurring, every advantage helps, and that's an advantage that you will know and experience and recognize straight away it's like instantly the moment you put them on you start climbing you'll know the difference and you'll never go back so whichever brand you go for whichever style of pad this this shanks on these are sort of offset as well that they, they, they ain't like a it's not like a perfect kind of t-shaped it's sort of an angle i find that is a better design as well it just sits more comfortably but whichever you go for I had geckos before this which were very good too, never came out or hardly ever. Aluminum, long gaffs with the narrow piercing profile, that's, that's really important. So we're in a forest um, that I'm familiar with, hopefully nobody's going to bother us, uh, large and small trees here. So, uh, one of the most important things, and it's a discipline as much as anything else, is to wear gloves. As much as I hate wearing gloves, and I often forget to put them on, or often think I'm going to get away with not wearing them. When you spur in trees, and there's any, there's a possibility of you gaffing out, which is um, quite probable with uh, conifers like firs, uh, Douglas fir in particular, you're going to gaff out and you're going to trap your knuckles behind your flip line and it's, you're going to lose some skin as a result. So, uh, and it's, you know, the amount of times I've thought I'm about to spur up a tree and I, and I look at my gloves think no I'll get away with it and then I climb up and then within a few feet I've skidded trapped my knuckles and I mean I, I'm still okay to work but I've uh, scabs on my hands then for a week or so it's really frustrating so put the gloves on um, you know they are clumsy awkward things at times that they, they certainly aggravate me but even if just to get up so far before you start cutting, it's it's worth it. Take them off, put them in your pocket thereafter. So we're going to use this 5.8 steel core flip line to start with on some smaller trees. It's way too big, to be honest. This one is 18 foot. It doesn't get used very much. Um, and it just ends up with a huge tail dangling down in the way most of the time. But um, a good way of taking advantage of that extra long tail might be to add another um, rope grab or friction hitch as a means to tying in twice you might find that useful. I know a lot of companies insist on you being tied in twice when you're climbing and cutting, not so much with forestry work, but with, um, you know, arborist tree service types. So that is something that you could do as opposed to having a separate piece of rope, just use the same one. You do end up with a bit of a a loop, a belly in it, but you can always kind of tie that up. So, take it or leave it. So this flip line is 5 eighths 
Um, a lot of people uh, go for a narrower diameter than this, often, you know, half inch, um, which is fine if you're not doing a lot of spurring without a brake. Um, you know, sort of residential hardwoods where you can use the lean of a tree because they often take twists and turns and lean in different directions. Um, you know, you can kind of lean forward and advance your flip line, be it half inch or five eighths or three quarters or whatever. And it's not usually a problem. There isn't really you know, it doesn't take so much physical uh, exertion or, or staying power. But um, when you get into like uh, where we are, there's a lot of old growth trees here. And you might have to spur a hundred feet or more on big wood um, with no kind of break or, I mean, you know, you can rest for a minute but the strength doesn't really come back in your hands once you get worn out. So um, what helps you is when you have something to actually get a hold of. You know, my lanyard that I use for climbing a lot of residential trees, hardwoods in particular, I just use a short skinny lanyard. It's not even half inch because um, it just comes out it's more of a work positioner than anything. It's not it's not really a flip line for spurring up anything of size. So um so it's fine, I can manage. You know, and like I say I take advantage of the lean of the hardwood trees as well, so I, I'm not actually hanging on to the flip line. Uh, lanyard, I just said that, didn't I? Um so the point is uh when you get into big stuff and big wood you are you can't actually use that sitting back in your saddle technique to advance the line because it's too wide the line won't actually go anywhere so you're having to kind of set a wave in the flip line that comes starts at one side and comes round in the other to advance it and then you move forward. But in doing this, like I say, you're getting no support from the rope. You're basically using the flip line high and you're pulling yourself up and then you're advancing it again. So there's no respite really. Now, you know, if you want it like this is a, like a half inch, I think 13 mil bit of old climbing line, but you could use this as a, as a lanyard to a flip line to get up a tree. Easier still if you're wearing gloves because you can grip skinny rope a lot easier when you're wearing gloves. And that's all good and well, you, yeah, so you, you could manage. It's probably as effective, you get as much grip wearing these on this skinny rope as you would with your bare hands on a bigger line. And that's great until it rains. And then these get all slippery and you can no longer grip this rope wearing gloves. Now this happened to me, uh, I don't do many of the old growth trees, but we do get them a few times a year. Uh, I remember one particular incident in uh, Cathedral Grove when I was working for uh, Martin up there. And um, I had to get up a big tree, a big old fir, and um, traverse into a smaller one, which was dead. In not because it was the only safe way to do it was to swing across into the dead one and not the, bring the dead one down in sections. Um, and I use this rope here because I thought, well, it's nice and lightweight and I can I can flip it round and I work my way up. Now, the bottom part of an old growth fur is always a real sc scramble, especially with today's spurs, which are sort of inadequate for it. I think they're an inch and a quarter or 
maybe a bit more than that. But um, they're not like the old timers, spurs. So, you know, bark is falling out from under your feet and you're scrambling about. And, uh, you know, but that's to be expected. I had my gloves on and I had my flip line and I got up so far. But, you know, get, getting up and past, you know, up to 150 foot mark, I was, uh, I was feeling it and it was raining by then. And my gloves had lost all the grip, they were useless. So obviously I took them off so I could grip the rope better. But the fatigue in my hands by then was enormous. It was really hard to, you know, make any kind of progress. I was, I was dead tired up there, you know. It just, the tendons and the hands, because, like I say, you're not using that back support anymore. You're using, you're just relying on your arm strength. You're just hanging there. You know, moving up a couple of feet and then advancing it more. There's, there's, it, it's, it's hard going. So, uh, I learned never to trust this again if I'm going any kind of distance. Have something thick that you can get hold of. You know, we'll start with this uh, ground for not much life left in it. Um, anyway. Grand fur, you've got to press quite hard with your spurs because these little plates sometimes peel out. You think your spurs in and find out it really wasn't. So, uh, so client spur climbing for beginners. You know, usually um, you're using, you're leaning into the actual uh, flip line. Take a couple of steps, advance the line. And so on. You're always kind of leaning back the whole time. As you advance the line, you sort of put your weight back into it, take your steps. As you get better with practice, you tend to lean into the line less and just rely on your arms. And usually looking to hold the rope higher up so you can actually pull yourself and take more steps. See how high I'm going there? Spurting down is easy, but you have to make sure your spurs are hitting the wood at the right angle. Otherwise you might gaff out. So don't do it casually. Take your eye off the ball. Again. It's better to keep your flip line higher than lower. So if you did gap out, it'd catch you. I'll do that one more time. So you're looking to take kind of, you know, at least three steps for advancing the line.
We just help the woodpeckers along. We're making a few spur holes. This is important. It's all important. This is important. So what is this tree? It's about, I don't know, foot and a half. Rough bark conifer. It snags reasonably well on the rope, but that's still no kind of thing to rely on. In order to spur it up like I was just doing, to, you know, have enough slack in the line where I can advance it in a reasonable amount of time, you'll notice that there's a big gap between myself and the tree. I need that gap in order, in order, you know, to move the line about. If I had it up really close, I'd hardly be able to move, make any progress. And it would also put my spurs at a disadvantage because they'd be more upright. So, as you start getting into thinner trees, this gap becomes even bigger and because the tree is narrower you've got less surface friction between your rope and the tree so if you fall with any kind of gap if you gaffed out there's really nothing going to stop you other than wrapping your arms and legs around I don't think you may have the strength so long as you have gloves on to cinch this line around it but if it was like a eucalyptus or a, a maple or an arbutus you'd be go you'd be doing uh, well to stop yourself before hitting the crotch or before you slipped all the way into wider wood you only got to watch some of the mishaps in the pole climbing uh, competitions to see what I'm talking about so you always have to be mindful of that gap there on skinny trees Believe it or not, the wider the tree, the safer you are because you have a lot more surface area between the, the line and the tree. On skinny trees, there's not really anything suitable here I can show you. But we'll use this one, imagine it's half a foot smaller. Huge gap there, but I need that gap in order to progress. So remember we um, tied the friction hitch on the uh, on the other end of the rope earlier the extra friction hitch here it is has a carabiner on the end so this second tie-in could either be on the other end of your flip line or it could be a separate flip line or it could be your uh, climb line A lot of climbers just go when they want to be double tied in such a way they still go to the side D's which is great and fast if you're in you know reasonably big wood a couple of foot across at least um, but when you're into skinny stuff and we're addressing this other issue of gapping out and slipping down it's safer to go Use your second tie-in on your center D. Again, this doesn't have to be a flip line, it can just be a climb line. So, there we have our flip line to the side D. And then we have our second tie-in to the center D. And the reason it's safer, not only because then you're not purely relying on these two links solely on your saddle to save you but that, the going to the center D you get much less of a gap I hope you can see so you get much less of a gap you've got this big gap on the side D's but the center D has much less of a gap but you can still advance it. You can't reach as high as 
you know, you can with the side these to advance yourself, but you still make reasonable progress. It just takes a little bit of fiddling around. But the main advantage, like I said, is that circle is, you know, it will you'll hang off the side of the tree as opposed to skidding down it because there's much less of a gap here better chance of saving yourself a lot of pain so this is a 5 8 uh, line that I use for climbing up bigger trees, wider trees now this big clumsy buckle doesn't really help much the rope grab as well is questionable I don't like any device that has the potential to go into freefall mode. But the issue with climbing old firs, especially in the rain, when you're using a friction hitch, it gets all gunked up with green stuff and moisture and it's, you know, it, it, it can go to shit like and it can be just a battle to adjust your uh, adjust your line especially if you're cutting as well and then you end up with resin getting in the mix and it, it can, you can end up in just a sticky mess so a rope grab is sort of more user friendly but it's not as safe as a friction hitch so we found a big tree um, unfortunately too big to set this 5 8 line around so that was a bit of a balls up on my part but um, so we're gonna have to manage with the skinny one just to show you the advancing your line bit I'm only gonna go so far uh, you'll see again it's really easy to gap out on this old bark it just crumbles from underneath you but the biggest drawback of this line not just that you lose your gripping power but that it doesn't flick around as good as the thicker one because there's no weight in it it's it's pretty useless well i mean it's not useless but it's it's um it's not ideal a few uh, branches up there as well uh shit like that can really interfere with the line especially when it's a light line like this one um, because it won't flick around, the wave will just come to an end when it hits the branch and gets snagged and you're sort of stuck there struggling around. Well, trying to get your weight forward is key. But when you have this old growth bark like you do on Douglas fir, it's really hard to do that. So you're ever, forever being pulled back by gravity because you can't pivot on the spurs if it was like a red cedar of the same size it'd be a lot easier because I, to an extent I could pivot on the spurs while I loop the line around I need plenty of slack See the crumbly bark? See, so notice I'm hanging on. I can't really sit back, but I need this slack to move up. The advantage of using a bigger line so you can grip it.
There you have it. If only coming, if only going up was as easy as coming back down. See, this one's not quite as wide as the bark is, well, yeah. Something tells me the bark isn't as deep on this, so, and it seems a bit, I've got a bit more purchase in the spurs, so I can get the bigger line around this. I thought it'd be big enough for what we were doing today, it's like, I think this line is seven meters. It's not big enough to go right around. But this should be easier. <laughs> the same principle. Once you get past this lower bit. A bit too much slack. back down. Plenty of surface area on the flip line. And it'll just hang me there for fall. This little bit more weight in the rope means it'll travel better as well. It'll stay all the way till the end. And I was doing the other one, I was rolling it round and sort of, it was taking so long that I was starting to tip back by the time the wave reached me. So I ended up grabbing on this side, which is the wrong thing to do. You've got to keep your chest in as long as you can. More slack. See the whole time I was doing that, I'm hanging on. I got no real support from this because as soon as I sit in it, it's all tight. I'm not going anywhere. So imagine if you were using a skinny rope, you've got 150 feet, it was raining, you're trying to grip a skinny rope in gloves and do all that. 
Not likely. See, I'm sweating a little bit. I'm not out of breath. Only where I've been shouting. And it's important as well to mention, you know, you got to breathe and stay calm. Doing that close to the ground is one thing, but when you're up, you know, you start getting up above 80 foot and beyond, it feels different, although it's tapered in a bit by then. Suddenly all that slack that you have in your line, that was your friend before, kind of plays on your mind, you know, you sort of insecurities can start creeping in about having so much distance there but you just got to think logically take a deep breath and remember you're in control you've done the hardest bit already now you've just got to carry on doing exactly what got you up there in the first place you just keep calm you start panicking you soon get out of breath you get tired and before you know it you've frozen so keeping calm and putting things in perspective is an important part okay we're back home now kettle's on thanks for watching and hopefully you've stuck with the whole thing i know it's been quite a long video but it's you know there's so little i mean there's a few spur climbing videos out there um perhaps not going into as much detail as as what i've done because it's quite an essential skill out in this region that you have to learn uh well that you have to be able to do i know uh there's a lot more emphasis on rope access these days and it seems to be ever growing in popularity which has its place you know you could say certainly on some of them big gold furs that we were on today well, why not shoot a line up and just climb up there well uh, for one thing it's not guaranteed that you're gonna get anything worth shooting at you know and if you're aiming up at 120 feet uh, straight away you're gonna need at least you know a 250 foot line perhaps for another to go up go down and tie around the bottom something like that and then you may get that shot that you're aiming at you might get it soon it might take you 30 minutes to get it your throw line ball the throw ball goes over but often is the case with these thick kind of fluffy fur branches full of moss and lichens and all kinds of crap that the throw ball doesn't come back down and you've just wasted a load of time or it gets stuck so there's a lot to be said for being able to just walk up to a tree with a minimum amount of gear and just start climbing start climbing and start working that's how it's done in kind of forest situations because um, you don't want to be packing a load of stuff around you may have several trees like that to do in a day so it's not like recreational climbing where you can you have all these lines and throw balls and gadgets to and you've got all day to 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 sort of put them up there you know in the work environment you're under pressure you sometimes you've got to play it safe and just put your spurs on and get going and um it is obviously something that needs to be learnt and needs to be practiced and this part should be done you know early on in your career if you're just starting out it is worth learning now to use spurs and practicing it and advancing yourself and getting comfortable and accomplished at that technique it's it's the most one of the most basic things and uh so often nowadays you see it being neglected um so anyway i'll leave it at that i won't go on any longer won't keep you any longer um 
yeah leave comments uh if you have something to say if you have stories to tell your own experiences feel free there's endless amount of space to leave comments i don't always answer them all but i certainly read everyone and i appreciate it okay thanks